Father, in the name of Jesus, we bless your name because you brought us together so you can impart your very life, your very vision, your very goal, your very purpose of living to every one of us. Lord, we're praying that this day what we hear will mix with our spirit, will find the place of faith in our heart. And Lord, it will be words that will lead us into action in Jesus' name. We pray that you help us to be faithful to the preaching of your word so that, Lord, everything we hear will become life for every one of us. We pray that you cleanse us through the word and you grant us a new zeal, a new enthusiasm through the word in Jesus' name that your name will be glorified, that great will be the result of obedience in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can be seated. In Matthew chapter 28, reading from verse 18 all through to verse 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Here we find the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Stop right there. Every time you read the word of God, every time you hear the word of God, your concept, your understanding as to who is speaking to you matters a lot. If you think that another Moses is speaking to you, if you think another prophet is speaking to you, or if you think, and if you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ himself, our Lord and Master, our Lord and Savior, that he is the one speaking to us. What does the, the Bible say? Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday and today and forever. And he came and he spoke unto them. And he comes today in every service. And he speaks unto us. What did he tell them? What is he telling us? Saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power is given unto me in heaven and on earth. That will drive away fear from the heart of the true believer. That will help the true believer to feel excited, to feel happy, to feel unconquerable. Because our Lord and Master, our Savior and Redeemer, before he gives us the great commission, he says, all power on earth, all power in heaven has been given unto him. Go ye therefore. The word therefore means because all power has been given unto me, both in heaven and in earth. And between heaven and earth, you understand what the Lord is saying? I am Alpha and Omega and everything in between. I'm the first and the last and everything in between. I am the beginning and the end and everything in between. He has given me all power on earth and in heaven and everything in between. That means then for a child of God. That means then for a minister of the gospel. That means then for a soul winner. That means then for everyone called of God. Called to salvation. Everyone that names the name of the Lord on earth, in heaven, in between the earth and the heaven, there is nothing to fear. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. As you go from place to place, you'll find that in various nations, in the various tribes, there are peculiarities. This tribe is known for this kind of worthless power. This other tribe is known for another kind of useless power. This other tribe is notorious for another kind of power that has nothing but just bubbles. And it says, because all power on earth and in heaven has been given unto me, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. As we talk about evangelism, soul winning uh, in various forms, it says the result of that, whether you call it crusade, mass evangelism, soul winning, is in the number, not in the number of those who raise up their hands, 
not in the number of those who are present at that crusade, of the number who are baptized. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. There are evangelists and soul winners and church leaders that think that evangelism terminates at the time you gather them together and they'll be filled. And then you have a sea of heads. And we say, wasn't this a very great successful crusade? Not yet. And then when they make the altar call, and you see many hands raised up. And they say, yes, we accept. And then as you count those people, maybe they fill your decision card. After they have filled the card, and then you count and count and count, and it's difficult to finish counting. Wasn't that a great success? Not yet. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. How many times do we find about uh, maybe 30,000 people in a crusade will have raised up their hands? And then when it comes to teaching them all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, we don't see up to 10. The success of any evangelistic outreach is not just in gathering the people together to hear. They hear, they act on what they hear. They repent, they believe, they are integrated with the body of Christ. And then we have the privilege of teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, Go. And he said unto them, Go. I know we've heard that before. But there comes a time in the calling of a man. There comes a time in the calling of a woman that he has to arise and go. And it is then we know the genuineness, the authenticity of the faith and the faithfulness of such a minister. You see, while we're sitting down, coming to church, and sitting down and learning, and sitting down and listening, there's not much in that. It is when you have heard the word, and the Lord is saying, go. And then the Lord is pointing at you, go. And then you are sitting down. And you are finding all excuses in the land, all excuses in the community, all excuses that you can bring up, create, dig up from the circumstances around just to show that you cannot go. That's the time we know whether you are a believer or you are not a believer. We don't know believers by just reading the Bible. There is more. We don't know believers by just coming to church. There is more. We don't know believers by even preaching to other people. There is more. It is when you hear the word of God and it says go and then you are able to rise up. In fact, we're going to measure your faithfulness uh, from the distance between you hear the word go and the time you actually go. Let's say, for example, there's somebody, he doesn't know, he doesn't have as much gift as you have. He hears go. The next hour, he has gone. Another person hears go. The next day, he has gone. Another one hears go. It takes one week before he goes. Another one hears go. It takes one year before he goes. Are you going to reach them? How does heaven reach them? The people that hear from the Lord, Go and immediately doesn't take them a day, doesn't take them a week, doesn't take them a year, doesn't take them ten years before they go. Those are the people that God reckons with. Go, go ye therefore, and then it says it tells us, Go ye into all the world, all the world, all the world. Nigeria is not all the world. You know, there are people. They say there's so much work to do. Look at our nation here, Nigeria. Look at this stage. 
look at this stage and look at that stage. I would like to do like the children of Israel spent 40 years in that same wilderness. Just roaming about, just moving around, just going, being interchanging from region to region and stage to stage. And Nigeria is not all nations. Go, go ye into all nations and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is what? Tell me out loud. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that the crusade does not finish? At the point of raising up the hand, at the point of shouting and praising God because of healing, the crusade must, we must measure the success of the outreach of the crusade, of the mass evangelism, of the soul winning by the people that are baptized according to the word of the Lord. He that is baptized and is, uh, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And he that believeth not shall be damned. And you see, these signs shall follow. These signs shall follow. Look up here. You know, I know quite a lot of people. And they want signs. Signs and wonders. They stay in one place. Look at your shadow. While you are standing, your shadow will not follow you. When you are stagnant, your shadow is stagnant. You have to be on the go. You have to be on the move. You have to be running. And then your shadow will be running after you. Signs and wonders follow the people that are moving. I don't care how many years you pray for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, for the infilling of the Holy Ghost, for the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost, for the unction of the Holy Ghost, for the empowering of the Holy Ghost. If you are not going, you are not going to see signs and wonders. The signs and wonders will not come while you are just there, lazy, not acting, not doing the will of God. These signs shall follow them that believe. If they believe, they will go. If they believe, they will rise up and do something. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. And they shall take up serpents. And it, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall do what? Do what? Recover. And so, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Verse 20, everybody, we're going to read together. Won't you go? Do you see that? And they went for. What's the distance? What's the period? What's the period of time between the time you hear the word go and the time you actually go forth? Between the time you hear, arise, move on, preach the word, go, and the time you actually eventually respond, eventually believe, eventually answer the call, eventually do what the Lord has said, and you actually go. That determines your level of commitment to the Lord and your level of faithfulness to the Lord. I'm talking to you on faithfulness and fruitfulness in evangelism. Faithfulness and fruitfulness in evangelism. The God who has called us is a faithful God. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 9. God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. The God who has called us is faithful and the Savior Jesus Christ who has saved us is faithful faithful when looking at hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 wherefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession christ jesus who was faithful to him that appointed him he was faithful to god who had appointed him 
And then we are told, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. What does he expect of you of me today? Faithfulness. First Corinthians chapter 4. In First Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And what's the test of your faithfulness? What's the measure of your faithfulness? What's the test, the examination, the evidence of your faithfulness? The distance between the time you hear the word go and the time you actually make up your mind to go. And the more that time is prolonged, the more you show your unfaithfulness, your low level of faithfulness is required. In stewards, that a man be found faithful. And actually, the faithfulness we're talking about is faithfulness in all things. In Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Verse 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in that which is much. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful in that also in much. You see how God evaluates our faithfulness? You see how God weighs our faithfulness in the balance. And it says, when in little things, little things, little things, you are faithful. Then it shows the Lord that you are faithful in much. Then the latter part of that verse it tells us in that same Luke chapter 16 verse 10, And he that is unjust, is using that word unjust as the opposite of being faithful. He that is unfaithful in the least is unjust also, is unfaithful also in much. Have you noticed that birds of the same feather flock together? Faithful people, uh, you know, they have the tendency of finding one another, attracting one another, associating together. Uh, show me two people. If I know the first one is faithful, very likely the second one is a faithful man. And show me two people. If the first one is unfaithful and he has shown his unfaithfulness, he has shown that he's unjust, he's unfaithful, he's undependable, he's untrustworthy in small things and big things. Much, much likely, the second one, the friend, the associate, is also unfaithful, unjust, undependable, untrustworthy. Because we tend to move towards the people that have the same virtue as we have, that have the same liking as we have, that have the same commitment as we have. You don't find a hot person, somebody on fire, somebody who is on the go. Somebody is on the move. Somebody whose heart is turning up. Lord, what have you got for me today? I'm in a hurry. I want to rise up and do your will. You don't find a man like that associating each email with a cold, lethargic, lukewarm, unfaithful, untrustworthy, undependable man, undependable woman. Birds of the same feathers flock together. You are faithful. You are going to attract faithful people unto yourself. You are unfaithful. You are unjust. You are undependable. You are not trustworthy. You are going to attract people that are unfaithful, not trustworthy, not dependable to yourself as well. The Lord is calling us to be faithful. We shall be faithful in Jesus' name. How can you associate with a man like me and be unfaithful? Because to the best of my understanding, I want to be faithful in everything the Lord has called me to do. Whether it's in a village, in a city, in a town, in a community, in a nation, anywhere. If you associate with a man like this, and you call yourself a child, a son in the faith, to this pastor, you have to be faithful. In fact, that's what links us up together. Because once you are dragging your feet, and you are not faithful anymore, I say, hey, stay aside and keep your distance. I don't want your lukewarmness to affect my wanting to be hot for the Lord. You will be faithful. I said you will be faithful. 
faithfulness and fruitfulness in evangelism. There are three points we're going to consider before we pray. Number one, the call to faithfulness in evangelism. The call to faithfulness in evangelism. Number two, the concept of faithfulness in evangelism. The concept of faithfulness in evangelism. Number three, commitment to fruitfulness in evangelism. Commitment. Commitment to fruitfulness in evangelism. Number one is the call. Number one is the call. Uh, let's look at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Here is our Lord, our Savior, our controller, our director, and the one that has called us, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. It says, He came, the Son of Man is come. To seek and to save that which was lost in verse 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy. Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. You know, it's uh, wonderful when you know your calling. As many years ago, I listened to a man, and he's, you know, he's been on evangelism for I don't know how long now. I think now he spent more than 50 years just evangelizing, going from place to place. And uh, I still remember just one sentence in his message I listened to. And he said, here I am at 58, at that time I was saying you're 58. And I'm preaching now. And he's saying, by the grace of God, when I become 70, when I become 80, and who knows when I become 100, I will still be preaching the gospel. I listened to that, and I, I wanted to follow that man. Because I like to take people by their word. I want to hear what somebody has said. That this is what I will do. This is what I will do. And then I, I, I watched that man. He was 58 years of age. And he said, when I become 70, when I become 80, and then who knows when I become 100. Faithfulness, faithfulness. That you commit yourself. And then you follow the people that are faithful. Not the people that say. And they don't do it here. We are learning that we need to be faithful. Our call is to occupy until he comes. Not just to occupy and to serve and to preach and to labor just for a few years until he comes to take you home. And that should be the commitment of a real child of God. And you're looking at Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 6 and from verse 7. Proverbs chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 6, here is what the word of God says. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. Many people brag. But a faithful man who can find. Not all talkers are doers. There are people that talk high. There are people that talk big. There are people that boast a lot, but they do nothing. It says, many, many people, most men, will proclaim everyone is some goodness, but a faithful man who can find the just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. That's what the Lord is expecting, that we will be faithful. And you know, we're going to be faithful. And you will be faithful in Jesus' name. In Proverbs chapter 25, verse 13, As cold as the cold of snow, in the time of harvest, so is a faithful messenger to them that sent him. For he refreshes the soul of his master. What does a faithful servant do to the master? 
he refreshes the heart of the master our master is the lord jesus christ and he has sent us he has said go and every time you rise up and you go you refresh the heart of the master you make the heart of the master the master of the harvest you're the lord of the harvest you make his heart glad especially if the lord knows that around you in your family in your community there are challenges that will have kept you down tied you down and all the same in spite of those challenges in spite of those difficulties you rise up and you go you are faithful to the calling of the lord it says that man that is faithful a faithful messenger he will be like cold water in the time of snow at the time of harvest he'll be refreshing the heart of the people that sent him hey, don't you know how moses must have refreshed the heart of the lord in numbers chapter 12. numbers chapter 12 i'm reading from verse 7. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 7, My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. Uh, do you see how God rates people? Do you see how God evaluates people? Oh, you say, but he is a stammerer. Yes, but he is faithful. Those of you that are not stammering, what have you done? More than what Moses has done. He said, but he struck the rock twice. Yes, we know, but was a faithful man. Those who have not struck the uh, struck twice, where is their faithfulness? What have they done? A man that went to the mountain top and for the children of Israel fasted 40 days, 40 nights. Why are you looking at striking the rock two times? And why are you looking at the fact that it was his Tamara? And then when he came back and, the, and God said, Leave me alone. Let my anger wax hot against them. I will destroy them with Aaron. And that man went on his knees again. And God said, Moses, I will make you a great nation. And Moses said, I'm not looking for greatness. I'm looking for the salvation of these people that have gone away from you. And then he went again another 40 days, 40 nights, and he fasted and prayed for them. Oh Lord, he said, if you will not forgive them, take my name away from the book of life. You didn't see that. That's what we're talking about. The faithfulness of a man that when eventually... You know, you know what I've discovered? I discovered that idle people, lazy people, never do well people, they will sit down together, they will be finding fault with a faithful man. And Aaron and Miriam, Aaron of all people, Aaron has forgotten that he was the one that led the children of Israel into idolatry. And Moses said, God would have killed him at that time. But he said, but I fell on my knees, I fell on my face. I prayed for him, and God answered my prayer and delivered Aaron. And it is that Aaron, idle people are gossiping people. Idle people are busy body people. Idle people are talk artists. Idle people, they don't have any vision. They don't have any goal. There's no faithfulness. There is no task. There is no job that occupies their mind. Idle people are talkative. And so Miriam and Aaron, they began to talk together. How about this Moses? After all, we are older. My dear friends, you are older, but what have you done? More than your younger brother Moses. And then God came out. And he said, Aaron, listen to me. Idleness is what is making you. don't know what you're talking about. There are souls to say. There is work to do. There is harvest to reap, and you are not getting involved. What are you talking? Moses, my servant, is not so. It's not like the picture you are painting, who is faithful in all my house. The call to faithfulness. We will be faithful. Yeah. You, if you have a lot to do, you don't have any time to gossip. You think about, you know, this man I just spoke about, he lost born. At his own age, and then I am told that uh, the first day he had the minister's conference in Accra, and the people there, they had not done enough. And he, he just had 1,500. And then he said, you ministers here, what are you doing? 
You have not done enough. And then he said, the brother told me, he went around the city, did not see enough posters for his, uh, for his crusade. Very quickly, he put uh, some things together, some pictures and everything, and developed handbill, took it to the press at 84, took it to the press there, and, you know, printed every thousands and thousands and thousands. He said the second day, the place was flooded with people. And he said, I don't preach inside. Even though I'm talking to believers and ministers, I take them outside. The second day, the place was full of people. A man like that will not have time to gossip. A man like that does not have time to criticize. A man like that does not have time to complain. There's so much for him to do. And when you have so much to do, that your mind, your brain, your heart, your spirit, your energy, your time, your resources, everything you have, you're wondering, how can I spend my little time remaining to do the best I can do in my life? You'll not have time to gossip. You'll not have time, like Aaron and Miriam saying, this is wrong, and this is wrong, and that is wrong. Moses, my servant, is not so. He is faithful in all my house. I pray that you realize your calling. Amen. Number one, we are called to faith. You cannot be faithful if you don't have faith. Number one, we are called to faith. Number two, we are called by the Father and to the Father. We are called to the Father, and we are called by the Father. It's the Father who is faithful himself, who is calling us unto faithfulness. Number three, we are, we are, called, we are called to follow Christ, for worship, to follow Christ. Where will you go? What will you do? You'll be asking yourself, if Christ were physically here today, what will Christ be doing? And you will not listen to the gossip of the people. You will not listen to the insinuations of the people. You will not listen to the criticisms of the people. You will not listen to the opposition of the people. You will not observe the persecution of the people. You are asking yourself, if Christ were here today, on the planet here today, what will he be doing? Where will he be going? He will be going to the lost. Because I came to seek, I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. And he calls us to follow. He calls us to follow. That you'll follow Christ. In everything that you do, you'll follow Christ to go and seek and to save the lost. Number four, we're called to fellowship. We're called to fellowship. Not idle fellowship. Not a, an unproductive fellowship. A fellowship that produces results. A fellowship that goes to the harvest field, the fellowship of harvesters, the fellowship of believers, and the fellowship of laborers, and the fellowship of soul winners. We are called to fellowship of the people that believe the Lord and are acting according to the word of the Lord. Number five, we are called to the flock of the sheep I have that are not of this fold. Then I must bring that there will be one full, one flock, and one shepherd. Number six, we are called to forsake falsehood. We are called to forsake falsehood. It's telling us that there will be many false prophets. And yet it says we should be aware of those false prophets. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 15, be beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. But he won't let their ravening wolves. Beware of false prophets today. There's a lot of ecumenism, not unity. Ecumenism, not unity. That is, they want to call the right hand and the left hand come together. They want to call those who are walking the narrow path and those who are going the broad way come together. They want to call those who are saved by grace and they show the evidence of that salvation and they want to call those who are only mentally saved. And they don't have the life of real salvation. They want to call everybody together. Let's move on together. Let's walk together. How can we do that? What fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? What fellowship has light with darkness? That's not unity. Beware. Jesus said of false prophets. It's not just because somebody is carrying the Bible. Or somebody is mentioning the name of Jesus. Or somebody is saying, I'm a minister to you. I'm a Christian to you. We still have to look at the words of Jesus. Beware of false prophets. You know, there are, there are some people in our church who are lonely in holiness. Lonely in holiness. 
What I mean is because they belong to a church preaching holiness. And it's a kind of unique position. And it's a kind of almost an isolated position. Because not many people want to give up their carnality. The cell, the old man, and have the heart purified and sanctified. Not many people want to be holy. And therefore you find anywhere you go, you're almost alone in your place of work. Almost alone in even in religion. Even among Christian circles. And now you're feeling lonely. And then you're feeling, hey, why don't we get everybody and, you know, stop it. So we don't feel lonely anymore. Stay where you are. Instead of you going to them, let them come to you. If we're going to keep what the Lord has given us, we have to keep the word of God. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, of figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, is cut down, and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name have done many wonderful works, then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Is it right for those who are faithful children of God to be associated, glued, affiliated with workers of iniquity? Answer me, not for any reason, no. We are called to forsake falsehood. Number seven, we are called to feed and to feast for the family. We are called to feed and to feast for the family. It is when you are fed and you have the word of God and you know the word of God, you are able to take the energy and the strength you, de you, you have derived from that feeding and feasting on the word of God, you're able to now go into the world and do what the Lord has called you to do. We're going to be faithful. Point number two, the concept of faithfulness in evangelism. The concept of faithfulness in evangelism. Well, I want to make it very clear because you know, there are many people that use words and they do not understand the impact and the import of the words they use. And you'll find many people saying, praise the Lord, I am faithful. How do you measure the faithfulness of a man? How do you evaluate? How do you ascertain the faithfulness of a servant of God? I'm going to use that word, faithful. You spell it out. F, fearless for Christ. Fearless for Christ. Fearless for Christ. What makes a man unfaithful? Fear. The fear of tomorrow. What will happen to my family tomorrow? What will happen to me tomorrow? The fear of tomorrow. What will happen to my position tomorrow? The fear of tomorrow. What will I be? Where will I be? What are they going to call me tomorrow? The fear of the future. What if I leave the unknown for the, un the, 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 the known for the unknown? 
I am sure of where I am now. I am sure of what I'm doing now. I'm sure of my time now. I'm sure of my productivity now. I'm sure of where I am now. But if I leave this place and I listen to the word of the Lord, go. And if I go, what happens to my position? What happens to my friends? What happens to my family? Facelessness is fear. Fear. The people that have fear, those people cannot will not be faithful. It is fear that causes a man to be unfaithful. What's fear? Before I go on with faithfulness, fear. F-E-A-R. Forget everything and run. That's fear. Forget the calling of God. Run away. Run away from the call. Forget the Calling into evangelism. Run the opposite direction. Forget the commitment. Forget your consecration. Forget everything and run. And you see there are people that are running from the post of duty. There are people that are running away from consecration. There are people that are running away from what the Lord had called them to do. Everybody knows this man is an evangelist. This man is a great preacher. And he should go to where the people are, where the need is, and go and preach to them. But fear makes him to forget everything and run. But if you're going to actually do the word of God, the work of God, and you're going to show faithfulness, faithfulness begins with fearlessness for Christ. And let's look at Luke chapter 12. We're ready this morning in a Bible reading. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading to you from verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him, and not five sparrows sold for two fathers, and not one of them is forgotten before God, even, but even the very ears of your head are all numbered. Fear not therefore, ye are of many of much of more value than many sparrows. It says, Fear not, therefore, also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I, him will the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denies me, because of fear, I say go, he cannot go because afraid, afraid of position, afraid of what I may lose, what becomes of me. Too self, too much self-consciousness makes a man, makes a woman unfaithful. He that denies me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. When we spell that word faithful, the next letter is A, abiding in Christ. Abiding in Christ. If we're going to be faithful, we're abiding in Christ. We associate with Christ. We agree with Christ. Agreement with Christ. Association with Christ. Abiding in Christ. That's what helps us to be faithful in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Except it abides in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. The next letter is I. That letter I means you are identified with Christ. Identified with Christ. I was buried with him. Because I died with him. And then I rise with him. 
And the now life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and died for me. You are identified with him. You are, every time you identify yourself with him, you have died to all those things that used to take your attention before. You have died to all those things that used to get your mind before. It is that death, death with Christ, that makes you to actually abide faithful. So send I you to labor unrewarded. You identify with Christ. He was unrewarded. Look at the people he healed. Crucify him, they said. And then you identify with Christ. So send I you to labor unrewarded, to serve on page. When you identify with Christ, you're not looking at salary. To serve on page, on lodge, on such, unknown, to bear rebuke, and to suffer scorn and scoffing. So send I you to toil for me alone. It is when you identify with Christ, you are able to say, He bore it for me. And because he, because he bore it for me, I will bear whatever it is for him. So send I you to bind the bruised and the broken over wandering souls to walk and to weep and to wait to bear the bodies of a world a weary so send I you to suffer for my sake alone he gave himself for us in identifying with him we now give our lives for him so send I you to loneliness and longing he left heaven and he left all those angels that were worshipping him and he suffered loneliness here wasn't he alone born in the manger? Wasn't he alone carried to Egypt when Herod wanted to kill him? Wasn't he alone 40 days fasting in the wilderness? Wasn't he alone when he faced those Pharisees? If you have come to seek me, let these ones go. Wasn't he alone when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is that identification with the master that makes you to be able to say, you are faithful. If uh, you are looking for, you know, people to support you and people to gather around you and people to press you after you have done some good things you cannot identify what they love so send I you the loneliness and the longing with heart are hungry for the loved and the known forsaking home and kindred friend and dear one so send I you to know my love alone so send I you to live your life's ambition your literal ambition. I will do this. I will do that. When I finish this, I will do that. When I finish this, I will do that. Then when I am old and useless, when I'm old and I've finished my career, when I'm old and I've retired, when I'm old and I've provided for the rainy day, and then I will come. What did the Lord say? So send I you to live your life's ambition, to die to their desire. Self will resign. To labor long and love where men revile you so send I you to lose your life in mind so send I you to hearts made hard by hatred to eyes made blind because they will not see to spend though it be blood to spend and to spare not so send I you to taste of Calvary identify with Christ that is a faithfulness. If you cannot identify, there is a letter that is missing in the word faithful, and you cannot be faithful, that letter is missing. The next word is trustworthy in Christ. T, you are trustworthy in Christ. You can be trusted. We can commit things to your hand and close our eyes. And know that it will be done. Because you are faithful, you are trustworthy. In First Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians, I'm reading from chapter 2. First Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Here the word of God tells us, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust, We were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so we speak. And not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts. You are trustworthy in Christ. And then, H, you are honest in character. Honest in character. Uh, can, we be, can we be faithful if we are not honest? If we are dishonest in a place of work, can we be faithful? If we are dishonest to leadership, uh, can we be can we be faith, can we be honest? You know, if let's say your you know your pastor, I'm referring to myself. That's what the Lord has made me to you. 
A father should not be ashamed to tell his children, Hey boy, look at my face, I'm your father. That's not pride. When a father tells his children, Look up here, do what I do. Follow me, take my word, I'm your father. And a pastor should not be ashamed to say, It's your pastor. And when the pastor is asking you a question, and he's saying, How about this? If you are dishonest, that's not being faithful, even if you are wrong. You say, I'm sorry I'm wrong. Even if you went the wrong direction. I'm sorry I went the wrong direction. You made a mistake. I'm sorry I made a mistake. Even if the worst happens, you see. I'm sorry I see. Honesty. You cannot be faithful without being honest. If the age is missing out of it, where is the faithfulness? You are honest in character. In First Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 12. First Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Have your conversation honest among the Gentiles. Have your conversation honest among the Gentiles. That whereas they speak against you, as evil doers, they may by your good works which they shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. If you are focused in commitment, you are focused a commitment. You don't scatter yourself here and there, striking every iron and ne never make any impact. You are focused in commitment. And that's in the language of Paul the Apostle, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. That's a focused man. In his commitment, in his consecration, in his carrying out the work of the Great Commission. This one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. What's he saying? I've forgotten what I did yesterday. I'm reaching out to the new assignment. I've forgotten what I did for the past five years. I'm reaching out to the new assignment and to the new commitment. Reaching out to the one, to the thing that is before me, that's being faithful. But you know, it was sitting down. I was still satisfied with the results of the past. I was still glorying in the results of the past. And we're still so enthralled and so filled and so happy with the success of the past. And we're sitting down, sitting back. That's not faithfulness. It is when you say this one thing I do. You witnessed yesterday. You evangelized yesterday. You did some great things yesterday. That was yesterday. You will die if you don't move on. Because you see, it is that line, it is the push, it is the energy, it is the, the stirring up within you that is moving you on. And you say one thing, one thing, this is a new day, one thing, evangelism. When tomorrow comes, this is one thing, one thing I do, evangelism. And you are reaching out and reaching out, that is faithfulness. You are focused in commitment, you on compromising in conviction. Uncompromising in conviction. A compromiser can he be faithful? Never. His knees will be shaking. His mind will be trembling. His face will be down. He will not have any energy. He will not have any strength. It's just, you know, a wishy washy person. He doesn't have any backbone. A faithful person will have a backbone to stand. Will be able to say, Here is where I stand. Even though there may be opposition or persecution or contradiction, here is where I stand. A, a faithful man is an uncompromising man, is uncompromising in conviction. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach. In the name of Jesus. Let's stop there for a moment. You know what Jesus said? He said, I'm your Savior. I'm your Lord. I'm your Master. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses on both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Look up here. Here is Christ here standing before you and he's saying, go preach. 
in my name cast out devils now let's leave that here is here are these people on the left hand side they commanded them not to preach not teach in this name of jesus christ here you are standing in the middle christ on your right hand side saying go and preach preach in my name cast out devils in my name here comes these people here together no you will not preach where you tend where you lean where you fall will show whether you are faithful or not if you say i have only one master pharisees are not my master sadducees are not my master and the people in my community my tribe they are not my master my senior brother is not my master my cousin is not my master my wife is not my master is not the one to now change the word of christ who is a greater one my savior my lord the one who died for me on the cross of calvary or the sanhedrin or these people i don't even know them where did they come from what authority do they have they may have authority in their synagogue that's in their synagogue not on me and they came and they said what are you doing didn't we who are you i didn't know you i've never met you before on the day of my salvation i didn't know you on the day when i was sanctified did i know you when he filled me with the holy ghost and he gave me the great commission go and preach to all nations did i know you and when i saw the resurrected christ and he rose from the dead and he said here am i see my hand and see my feet all power in heaven on earth is given unto me go ye therefore into all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost teaching them all things to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and lo and behold i am with you always until the end of the world you were not there when he told me that and therefore these people say did not we strictly command you that you should not teach in this name thank god you know your position Thank God you know your place. Thank God you know who your real master is. In verse 19, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the thing which we have seen and heard. I have seen something I cannot keep quiet. I've heard something I cannot keep up. That's the language of an uncompromising man. If we're going to be faithful, we need to be uncompromising in conviction. L is laboring for Christ tirelessly at all costs. L is laboring for Christ tirelessly at all costs. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10, First Corinthians chapter 15, we're looking at verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. You will be what you ought to be. Give me a good amen. amen. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored, but I labored, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me that's how to be faithful you are fearless you are abiding in christ you are identified with christ you are trustworthy in christ you are honest in character you are focused in commitment you are uncompromising in conviction you are laboring for christ tirelessly at all costs i come to point number three commitment to fruitfulness in evangelism commitment to fruitfulness in evangelism a commitment is to be fruitful and if you are faithful you will be fruitful faithfulness leads to ends up in fruitfulness we're looking at john chapter 15 john chapter 15 verse 16 ye have not chosen me but i have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the father in my name he may give each you you see what why the lord has called us he wants us to bear fruit 
And if you are bearing fruits today, your commitment must be to bear more fruits. Come to verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Every branch that beareth fruit, that's one, that's one level. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. You see, that's why you don't trust. If you are bearing fruit already in evangelism, the calling of the Lord, the desire of the Lord, the ambition of the Lord for you, the aspiration that should be in your heart is that you bear, you go from the level of bearing fruit to bearing more fruit. And then we're told in verse 8, herein is my Father glorified that he bear much fruit. From fruit to more fruit to much fruit. That he bear much fruit, continue, then it says, and it shall, then it says in that same verse 8, so shall ye be my disciple. Chapter 4 of John. John chapter 4, from verse 35, John 4, verse 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Now, you see the way I've read it, I didn't treat it with a question mark. The reason I did that is because the question marks were not in the original. The punctuation marks were not in the original. Somebody could put a question mark, it, was, it will mean, say not ye. Are you not saying? Are you not thinking? Are you not discussing? Are you not telling yourself, among yourself, there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Are you not saying there is still time? Are you not saying this is not the time yet? Are you not saying there is a period of delay? Are you not saying conditions are not quite right now? Are you not saying, well, all the things are not put in place yet. What are you waiting for? I'm waiting for this. I'm waiting for this. I'm waiting for that. It is when all those things come to place, then I will go. Are you not saying there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. Now, read it the other way now. Say not ye. Are you not saying, say not ye. Are you not discussing among yourself? Don't discuss that way. Are you not saying the time is not right? The time is not right. Are you not saying this is not the appropriate time when we're going to go out and harvest? Are you not saying this is rainy season? Who can plan any outdoor program now during this rainy season? This is hot season. And people, when they come out in the sun, they feel so hot that they will be, they will be sweating. Now, if we cannot do it in the rainy season because it's raining, and we cannot do it in dry season because it is hot, when are we going to do it? Excuses are everywhere. The excuses abound. And the Lord is saying, don't say that again. There are yet four months, they come as the others. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He that reapeth receiveth wages. He that reapeth receiveth wages. Now, don't, don't misunderstand. He that reapeth receiveth wages. It's not talking about salary. You know, it's not talking about money. Because they send these people to reap. How much money did he give them? Because you see, we, whenever we read the Bible, we put our own meaning, interpretation on those words. Wages, that's the word we use in the labor union. But here, it's talking about something that you get from heaven. He that reapeth receiveth wages. Wage in Jerusalem. Until ye be endured with, with power from on high. You have power from on high. That's the wages. The presence of God. I will never leave you. I will never, I will never forsake you. That's the wages. My presence will always be with you. So we may boldly say, the Lord 
is my helper of whom will I be afraid I see not said I will never leave you I will never forsake you that presence of God does that's the way Jesus and then he said these signs and wonders shall follow you those signs and wonders those are the wages he that reapeth receiveth wages and then the reward the reward we have on this earth and the joy we have when we get to heaven well done faithful servant enter ye into the kingdom of god he that reapeth receiveth wages and then it says and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together and herein is that saying true one soweth and another reapeth i send you to reap that whereon ye are bestowed no labor all the men labored and ye are entered into their labors you know what it means so the men labored all the men labored and ye are entered into their labors have you noticed today i go to a place to preach and i don't have to uh, set up a printing press to print the bible other people have labored already and in the labor for the people they have already printed the bible in their language you know i go to a place to preach and they don't understand english and there are other people already that have grouped themselves together and they have spent years in translating the bible to their local language other people have labored already i go to a place and then i uh, were looking for you know the people that will support and those church locations are there and the people to see the family to hold the crusade they are there already other people they put everything on ground and then you are just to go there now and read other people labors i was listening to a particular message and uh, this man uh, you know a young man but uh, an american and then he had gone to this tribe of people his father went to that tribe when his father got to that tribe those people were warriors nobody had ever come they don't accept strangers and the father of this american he labored and labored in that place and then one of the tribe's people shot him killed him that's what he do in that place and eventually when the son heard that his father had been killed where he went that son left his job in america and then went to the gospel and went to that same place and then went to that man that killed his father and he said i'm the son of so and so what my father was trying to tell you that you didn't understand and you killed him is that he's saying god is love and jesus is our savior for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life and then they brought him near they couldn't kill him because they had killed his father they said what kind of man is this we killed his father he knew we killed his father and he is coming to our tribe what kind of passion what kind of love is this they accepted him and the murderer of his father was his first convert and then after he became converted, they made him sit down. They, they taught him their language. And then they established the church. And then they evangelized. And I knew about him because they came to the conference. One conference I attended. And it was the time of that American to share. And then he brought out that man. And that man spoke in their language, in their native language. Nobody understood, but that man understood. And he interpreted and he said, what he's saying is, we were in darkness when we killed his father. But then his son came and he came to tell us about this love of God. We now know that God is love and Jesus is Savior. And now we believe in the same God. And I'm going to go to heaven eventually and go and meet his father that I killed. And you know that congregation well they were clapping but i didn't clap with them because i was wondering can i do that can you do that if they killed your father in evangelizing a particular place all the people labored that's what the father did the father was laboring and then this son now came to reap the benefit of what his father had sold and that's what jesus christ is saying the commitment is asking from us and he's saying i send you to reap that whereon you have not bestowed any labor or the men labored and ye entered into their labors the lord is calling us i believe we're going to respond we're going to do the will of god romans chapter one 
Romans chapter 1, I'm reading to you from verse 14. I am debtor, both to the Greeks, this commitment. I am debtor, both to the Greek and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So much, as much as in me is, I am ready. That's commitment. I am debtor. In verse 14, I am ready. In verse 15, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Then verse 16, for I am not ashamed. Whether well, that's what translates into commitment in our lives. That's number one, I know I'm a debtor. I owe a debt to the sinners. I ought to pay. And then, number two, in verse 15, I am ready. I'm ready to do it. And then, number three, in verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I am better. I'm ready. I'm not ashamed. And when you can say that from the depth of your heart, and then you rise up. And then you go forth and you go out to do what the Lord is calling you and calling me and calling us together to do. Then it shows our commitment to that faithfulness and fruitfulness in evangelism. In Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. I'm reading to you from verse 21. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I what not I know not. For I am in a stretch betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. It says, I would rather go to heaven. But I see the need. A lot of people to be saved. A lot of people to know what it means to actually love the Lord and what it means to give themselves to the Lord. Therefore, I would rather stay. That's commitment. John chapter 12 verse 24. John chapter 12 verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into, into the ground and die. It abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. That's the commitment the Lord is expecting from you, from everyone. That you die to your small ambition. You die to your excuses. You die to the pool of your community. That is, the, your community, they are drawing you. And they are giving you many, many reasons why today should not be the day of obedience and commitment. You die to them. And you die to sell. And then you bring yourself to the altar of the Lord. And you say, Lord, here I am. You gave your life for me. I am now going to give my life to you. The Lord is challenging you today. And is calling you to commitment. I gave my life for thee. My precious blood I shed, that thou mightst ransomed be, and quicken from the dead. I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given me? Have you given God as much as one hour every day? Have you given God as much as one whole day in a week? Have you given God your whole life saying, Oh Lord, you gave everything for me. I'm going to give everything to you. I spent long years for thee in weariness and woe. That an eternity of joy mightest thou know. I spent, I spent long years for thee. as thou spent one for me? You know, in other ministries and churches, some people will take sabbatical leave. They're not on full time. They'll take one whole year. They give themselves that one whole year to their church, to their ministry. And they say, I'm taking leave. And they're paying me my place of work. I give this whole year to the ministry anywhere there's work to do. Send me there. Have you done that? I spent, I spent long years for thee. As thou spent one for me, my father's home of light. 
my glory circle throne. I let for earthly night, for wanderings such and lone. I let, I let it all for thee, as thou let aught for me. I suffered much for thee, more than thy tongue can tell, of bitterest agony to rescue thee from hell. I have borne, I have borne it all for thee. What hast thou borne for me? Any little challenge we'll face in the ministry, any little problem we'll face in the ministry, that will be the talk of the day. Have you heard I was persecuted? Have you heard they stole something from me? Have you heard what happened in my place? Have you heard what I'm suffering? Have you heard the great burden on me? Any little suffering for Christ will be the talk of the day. Well, Jesus did more than that. Put that aside. Push that aside. And move on. Lord, let my life be given. And every moment spent for God, for souls, and for heaven. And all our ties be rent, be broken. Thou gavest, thou gavest thyself for me. Now, this very moment, I give all for thee. Let's rise up and pray. The Lord is calling us to commitment. And he's saying, I've given it all. I've given it all. I've given it all for thee. Watch. Are you willing to give for me? He calls us to evangelize. He calls us to win souls. He calls us to our neighbors, to our community. Go preach the gospel to every creature. Go tell them. Let this be your ambition. Let this be your lifestyle. You're not looking for the praise of men. You're not looking for reward from man. You're not looking for appreciation from man. You're saying, Lord, the rest of my life, I give completely unto you. I will serve you. I will win souls. I will labor. I will work. I'll do everything I can do. For the glory of your name, for the salvation of humanity. Rise up and do it.